All right, Adam. Now, if you could um, prepare the presentation from Dr. Wu. So as mentioned, Dr. Wu has been working at, don't play it yet, please, uh, has been working with Professor Brain in Cambridge and Carol did reference some of Dr. Wu's work. And that spurred me on to actually reaching out and making contact with Dr. Wu. I had tried previously, but as a postdoc, Dr. Wu has moved around a bit and has lost communication during the pandemic. Anyway, we met uh, earlier in the week in London and I was able to persuade Dr. Wu to give us uh, some further information about her work. And as it happened, she had also worked with Professor Claire, who will be presenting this afternoon. So we have a great context within which to um, put in uh, an extra talk that was not advertised, apologies for that. But I would begin um, and make you aware of Dr. Wu by reading out a brief biography before we commence her presentation in two minutes. Dr. Yutsu Wu is an academic track fellow at the Population Health Sciences Institute, Newcastle University, UK. As an epidemiologist, she conducts aging research focused on investigating the potential impact of environment on health and well being in later life using quantitative analytical methods. During her PhD and postdoctoral periods, she has worked with several UK-based and international cohort studies and analyzed complex data on dementia and healthy aging. She is a biostatistician. Before joining Newcastle University, she worked as an epidemiologist statistician for the Improving the Experience of Dementia and Enhancing Active Life or IDEAL project at the University of Exeter together with Professor Clare and a postdoctoral researcher for the aging trajectories of health, longitudinal opportunities and synergies or ATLOS project at King's College London. She currently resides here in Lewisham and we hope that she will, of course it's 6 a.m. here, so we're hoping Dr. Wu will join us later in the afternoon in Hong Kong for Q&A, but please do post any questions following the presentation that we will pass on to Dr. Wu and certainly we will try to answer the questions as best we can. Thank you, Adam. Please commence Dr. Wu's pre-recorded presentation. Hello, my name is Yu Zhu. I'm a research fellow at Newcastle University. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this conference. The title of my presentation is Love Environment and Healthy Aging. I would like to share some experience on integrating geographical and cohort data to investigate the relationships between environmental factor, health and well-being in late in life. We all know that population aging is an important issue across the globe. In the UK, nearly one fifth of the population were aged 65 or above in 2018. To provide a supportive environment for increasing number of older people, the idea of age-friendly cities or age-friendly environments has been uh, proposed and received attention from policymakers and researchers. So what is the role of environment in healthy aging? According to the recent World Health Organization framework, the concept of healthy aging is defined as the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being in latent life. This includes the abilities of meeting basic needs, being mobile, and continuing to enjoy life over the aging process. Functional ability is determined by the interaction between intrinsic capacity which combines individual physical and mental health conditions and the environment which forms the context of an individual's life. This framework shifts away from the traditional disease-based model and focus on what we can still do in old age. A person may live with certain physical or mental health conditions, but they can still maintain their functional ability if the environment is supportive. 
In recent years, many aging cohorts have been established across the world. These cohorts generally have collected detailed information on intrinsic capacity and functionality. In particular, repeated measures over time are used to investigate the trajectories of healthy aging and identify risk factors and determinants related to health and disabilities in later life. However, a relatively small number of cohort studies have collected data on environment. Most of these cohorts are community-based, including people living in the real world, and therefore the context where an individual exists is important. This also corresponds to the literature on health inequality and social determinants of health, which has highlighted the impact of factors beyond individual level on population health. To investigate the contextual factors, I have explored some possible approaches to add environmental data, in particular the features of the built environment to existing cohort studies. Here I summarize some common approaches to obtain data on the built environment. Urban and rural areas are very common, but the definitions of these two categories can differ across studies and regions. Small area level measures are generally based on administrative or census units such as villages, towns, counties. In the UK, lower layer super output area, LSOA, is an area unit designed for UK census with an average of approximately 1,500 people per unit. Several small area statistics have been published based on LSOAs, and this provides an opportunity for data linkage between cohort studies and government statistics across the whole country. Residential area level becomes more common in recent years. The advance of data science allowed people to obtain and share maps and spatial data online. And this also provides opportunities for researchers to capture features of the built environment for different cohort studies. I am going to talk about two projects that I have been working on. The first one is the ideal study, a large cohort of people with dementia and their cares in Great Britain. I'm going to talk about how I collect environmental data for the ideal participants and use these data to investigate environmental factors related to living well with dementia. The second project is the 1066 study, an international cohort study focusing on aging and dementia in low and middle income countries. I will explore the possible approaches to collect environmental data for all the people living in diverse settings. Here I summarize some key information on the ideal study. I use the ideal baseline data, including over 1,500 community-based people with dementia across England, Scotland, and Wales. The baseline interview was carried out between 2014 and 2016. The interview collected a wide range of data on psychological, socioeconomic, and health factors and multiple living well measures. For small area level measures, I focused on area deprivation. In the UK, index of multiple deprivation has been widely used to indicate characteristics related to poverty and socioeconomic disadvantages. The three countries, England, Scotland and Wales, have slightly different measures, but the key domains include the characteristics of people, such as employment, education, and the characteristics of place, such as barriers to services and crime. To create a comparable measure for the ideal participants across the three countries, the probation quintiles was generated based on all area units for each country. The result here shows the distribution of area level factors in the ideal study. 
Uh, we can see that the ideal participants generally live in uh, wealthy areas, and less than 10% of the participants live in the most deprived quintile. We also investigated the relationships between deprivation and living well measures. We found that the scores of quality of life, life satisfaction, and well-being decrease from the least to the most deprived quintiles, and the relationships remain similar after adjusting for social demographic and health factors. This is an example focusing on quality of life. Um, here we uh, further stratified the association by the availability of um, care. We can see that the estimated core AD score decreased from the fifth, the least deprived quintile, to the first, the most deprived quintile, and the decreasing pattern seems to be particularly strong in those who did not have a care. Small area level measures were generally based on government statistics and depend on boundaries of administrative units. These units might not reflect the real activity space of an individual. Recent studies have used geographical information system to identify environmental features close to participants' residents. In the ideal study, we first geocoded participants' postcodes. We converted the tags of postcode information into latitude and longitude coordinates and generated a 400 meter linear buffer for all participants. This figure is not a real data. It is an example shows the buffers and different environmental features within the buffering area. We use GIS data to estimate the areas and percentage of uh, green and blue spaces within 400 meter buffers for the ideal participants. Open green space and river data provides different types of green and blue spaces across Great Britain. In the ideal interview, the participants were also provided a list of green and blue spaces and they were asked to report uh, whether they have any of these spaces within a 10 minute walk from their residence. To compare the objective and perceived measures, we categorize the green and blue spaces into these seven types. We examined the agreement between the perceived and objective measures. We investigate whether a participant living close to a park were also reported in the interview. We can see that the percentages of agreement were around 40 to 65 percent, apart from C, which was uh, over 90 percent. And the percentages were similar across people with different walking speeds. This indicates that the perceived and objective measures for green and blue spaces can have different meanings for people with dementia. We also found that the perceived and objective measures had uh, different associations with quality of life in people with dementia. This figure shows that the estimated changes in core AD score across the quartiles of the objective and uh, perceived measures. A higher quality of life score was found in participants who reported more local green and blue spaces, particularly in urban areas, while the relationships with objective measures were generally not clear. The ideal study is an example of integrating environmental and cohort data in the UK. I would like to briefly talk about cohort studies outside of the UK, in particular the studies in low and middle income countries. To explore the possible methods, we use the 1066 study, which is a international cohort study of all the people in eight low and middle income countries. Here, I only focused on three countries, China, Dominican Republic, and Mexico, as their address information was more complete. 
We obtained data on local amenities and services from Google Maps and OpenStreetMaps for uh, these study areas. Due to the limited budget, we only focused on eight amenities and services, uh, which were related to daily life, healthcare, and lifestyles in older people. Um, this figure, two figures shows the geographical information in urban and rural China sites from uh, Google Maps and OpenStreetMaps. We converted the address tags in the cohort uh, studies into the latitude and longitude coordinates and estimate the distance to the nearest services from participants' residence. We then investigate whether uh, living close to these local services can reduce the risk of having dementia. We investigate the associations between these eight types of services and dementia, which was measured by the 1066 algorithm adjusting for social demographic factors and self-rated health. Amongst the eight services, we found that uh, convenience stores and hospitals were associated with dementia in older people living in low and middle countries. Living far from these two types of daily life and healthcare services were associated with higher odds of dementia. In this presentation, I have shown some possible methods to integrate geographical data into existing cohort studies in the UK and international settings. I believe adding environmental data to existing aging cohort can be a fruitful approach to investigate the role of environment in supporting healthy aging. It needs the collaborations across different disciplines and expertise. And there are some challenges for future research since most GIS and spatial data are developed in the last decade. It can be difficult to find historical data match the study period. And the same environmental features can mean different things to different populations. We also need to investigate the dynamic interactions between intrinsic capacity, functional ability, and the environment, and develop strong methodologies to strengthen analysis in this field. I would like to thank co-authors of my publications and many colleagues from several institutes. I would like to acknowledge the study participants, their family, local PIs, staff and funding bodies supporting these studies. Thank you. Well, we're very grateful to Dr. Wu for a fascinating presentation. I'll make some remarks, but then close until uh, we resume at 2 p.m. The first is that my own observation in Hong Kong is that, and I'll include some references to work done in Hong Kong on the effect of geographic location. Hong Kong is a very congested geographic location in that there is a very dense population uh, arrangement in housing, uh, which means that I think compared to Tokyo maybe is the most densely populated region in the world. But paradoxically, there is also an enormous amount of green space in Hong Kong. Some 90% of all land surface land area in Hong Kong is in fact green space. And the reason for the paradox is in Hong Kong, there is a large amount of very undulating land, which means that flat land is very rare. And therefore people, although living in a essentially a vertical lifestyle, there is the accessibility to green space virtually on your doorstep in most parts of Hong Kong with the exception perhaps of Sim Tha Choi. So in that context, what's very fascinating is to observe in Hong Kong every morning, uh, very often people walking in these green spaces. So let's just take the University of Hong Kong. Some of you have visited and others are there. There is a, 
um, an area called mid levels, which describes the fact that the university is situated halfway up the peak that is the tallest, well, one of the tallest parts of Hong Kong. And at the time of around four to 5 a.m., you'll find many, many seniors walking around the trails leading up to the peak. Indeed, this is a very common uh, way to start the day throughout Hong Kong. This includes stops for Tai Chi, which you can observe on campus uh, at the university, and also elsewhere in green spaces in public parks that are also quite a uh, remarkable feature of Hong Kong. So we have on the one hand, a very congested uh, living arrangement and the average size of accommodation is, is quite small. But uh, in addition to that, access to green space. Now, one of the advantages I suppose of being in a congested vertical living arrangement is that services are remarkably accessible as Dr. Wu remarked in her presentation in other locations so that for most seniors who reside at least on Hong Kong Island, it's possible to access a pharmacy or even a, a doctor within, oh, five minutes. That's a, possibly a slight exaggeration, but most community uh, areas are very, very, very well serviced with often 24 hour supermarkets, medical and healthcare. Uh, and these are literally on the doorstep for a very large number of people. So this somewhat unusual arrangement is I think unique, certainly not true in London at all. And I would say not true in many other cities that I know of. So we have um, both a very uh, close knit community of seniors residing in tower blocks, but we also have plazas and common spaces outside of those tower blocks for seniors to congregate. Social mixing is, is daily, as I pointed out. Uh, and the type of combination of social interaction with the uh, exercise, Tai Chi and walking in green spaces uh, also enhances, I believe, the cognitive activities that we see as reserve and we discussed yesterday, which is truly um, beneficial, in my opinion, for healthy aging in Hong Kong. And just to round off the morning, uh, if you have yum cha, dim sum, you'll find most restaurants, at least in every block, you'll find at least one, often very large, dim sum restaurant. And by Mm, maybe 7 a.m. It's full. It's full of people every morning who come to eat together in large round tables and often read newspapers. And the majority of people, at least uh, in the region of the university, are seniors, sometimes with their carers, oftentimes not. But you will find this type of eating together arrangement all over the city. And this is another unique cultural feature that I want to emphasize because not only does it bring value potentially in diet and nutrition, um, but it also engages people, often singletons who may be living alone in a daily social interaction, which therefore brings communication and often communication in more than one language. So I want to finish up the session from Dr. Wu just by focusing on the fact that reserve, both cognitive, physical uh, resilience is something that I think is special in Hong Kong and therefore the Greater Bay Area. And I hope we'll have further discussion of that this afternoon because we offer something unique to the international perspective on healthy aging and building resilience. So please join me again in thanking Dr. Wu and all participants this morning. Go and have your lunch and we'll resume again in 40 minutes at 2 p.m. Hong Kong time with our next presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.